so freaking bad. WrestleMania. Welcome everybody to Juice Pro Wrestling episode 194. Quick on the draw. That's right. We're quick on the draw with former WWE and WCW superstar, former WCW tag team champion of the world. The one, the only, Raging Cajun Lash the How in the world are you, man? Dude, I'm rocking. I'm rolling, brother. I'm so excited that we get to sit here and talk to you tonight. It's kind of surreal. I remember the days of watching Nitro and WCW growing up, and you were kind of one of my favorite up-and-coming wrestlers, dude. And then all of a sudden, it was like, what happened? Yeah, I went from up-and-coming to down-and-going. I'm not really sure what happened there, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of a good starting point here, because... We're going to talk about where you've been and what you're doing now, which I think is in a lot of ways, a lot cooler than the wrestling side of things. Um, let's talk about, uh, so you entered WCW, what, 97? Yeah. Training at the power plant and all that. Go into the cruiserweight division. Tell me what it was like to be on television back in the day. We had Buff Bagwell on the show just recently. Um, but it's cool to kind of get, you know, you guys were there living it when you had like eight or nine million people watching wrestling every Monday night. What was that like for you, man? Strangely enough, man, we did, I did not have anything else to compare it to. You know, it's not like I came through the territory days. It's right. not like I came up through the independence. Right. So for me, it was par for the course, and it seemed normal to me at the time. Now, looking back, I can see what a golden era it was. And but man, it was just a rock and roll lifestyle, and it was awesome time to be in the business. It was an awesome opportunity for me, and it was really cool, especially for me because I came in at a time. A lot of people don't realize this because when I, I had this blessing, I had this blessing that when I was young, I looked old for my age, and the older I get, I look younger for my age. Right, so it's worked out for me a little bit in that regard. But I started, man, with WCW, like you said, about 97. To give you some perspective, if I graduated high school in 95. So oh, that's shit. how young I was. And, yeah, and I never did any independence. I just kind of stepped right into the power plant, and it came natural to me. So guys that grew up watching were still young enough to be maybe a little past their prime, but, man, they were still going. So all these guys I looked up to that I was big fans of were still a big part of WCW, man. So I'm rubbing elbows with them. I'm working with them. I'm learning from them. I'm being able to respect them and spend time with them. I'm on the road with them. I'm with them more than I'm at home with my family. For and sure. so it was a cool time to be a part of the business. When it's exploding, when business is good, when all these stars are still around and not so far gone in their prime that they can't go, and I'm a young guy, man, coming in and learning the ropes, literally and figuratively. Dude, uh, and speaking of respect, let me ask you this, because you you didn't come up through the indies or the territories. I mean, you're you're essentially a product of the power plant. Was there yeah. were you, did you ever catch any shit from any of the older boys in the back? Like, you know, hey, you didn't pay your dues or any of that type of bullshit. No, not at all. And I'll tell you for a couple of reasons. Uh, first. To foremost is this, what I have found in general, I had to grow up quick when I was younger. Man, oh, yeah. I was homeless my junior and senior year of high school. So I, I had to mature very, very, very quickly. I learned a lot of life lessons without having to be a young, bullheaded guy to learn them the hard way. And some of those life lessons I learned was this, but you give respect, you generally get respect in life in general, right? If you're Don't respectful rule. to people out in public, and saying hi to people and being polite and giving them the benefit of the doubt and not just rubbing them the wrong way because you've got a personal attitude. Generally, people have a tendency to reflect that same kindness and respect back at you. And I found for me, coming into WCW, I was always respectful to those guys that came before me. And because of that, I would see guys that have been in the business a lot longer than me do exactly what you were saying, get ribbed or begin a little bit of hard time and never maliciously, but you know, some of the people that were notorious for that, like the Steiners, you'd see them get a hold of a Billy Kidman or a Disco Inferno. And then they relatively pretty much left me alone. And I think it was because I was so respectful to them. And along the same line, 
plans. I spent enough time at the power plant that people knew my story. And I built a little bit of a reputation for myself of paying my dues to the extent that I could that way because I'm an Alabama boy, man. I grew up in Alabama. My daddy was from Lafayette, Louisiana, but I never knew him. And so I drove from Alabama to Atlanta two hours, one way, two hours back, 10 hours a day training at the power plant, five days a week, paying them to train me. Yeah. And I did that for almost a year before I ever got an opportunity and uh, was given an opportunity a little earlier than that. And I said, I don't think I'm ready yet. And I want to make sure that when I go out on TV, I'm not embarrassing myself. Right, right. And so because of those things, I think those guys, man, people talk in the business. They know who's respectful and who's not and who carries themselves like they think they're the ready-made microwave superstar. And, and who's coming in and doing it the right way. And I got a quick reputation, I believe, uh, for doing it the right way and, and hanging around the right people and letting the right people influence me like, in a, like a Brad Armstrong and a Scott Armstrong and a Steve yes. Armstrong and, and Sarge at the power plant. Sarge. And, you know, the, these guys that, that had built up that gravitas over the years. And so people mm-hmm. knew if, if – if, if a Brad Armstrong respects me, then who is who are these other guys to not respect me? Exactly, man. Uh, and, dude, what was Sarge like? Because I know, dude, he commands a lot of respect. And you get guys like, uh, I mean, even to this day, Bill Goldberg was like, hey, man, you know, I would be nowhere if it was for this guy, you know. Well, let me, let me ask it to you this way, Juice. Have you ever played football or any kind of sports in high school or anything like that? Right. Yeah. Okay, if you've ever been competitive on any level in your life whatsoever, you're either coachable or you're not coachable. Right. Generally, people who are coachable realize when someone's trying to help you out or not. So if you had a high school football coach and you probably had that coach, whatever it is that you did that got in your face and would headbutt you to get something, get you to do something the right way or would just yell at you and scream at you. But there's a nagging voice in the back of your head going, He's not berating me. He wants me to be the best that I can be. He's after what's best for me, not to try to tear me down. He's trying to build me up. And I think that most people that are successful in the wrestling business have that voice in the back of their head, and they get that. They have those competitive juices, pardon the pun. They have that competitive uh, aspect about them. They know what it takes to be on that level. And someone like a Sarge, it's his job to pull that out of you, man. And so yeah, if he's yeah. getting in face like a drill sergeant, but he's fair, man, I'll take that all day long. I want to know where, you, where I stand with you. And I don't want you sugarcoated. I want you to make me the best that you can make me. So when I walk in the, the power plant and he goes, grab a bucket, and you've got five gallon buckets in the corner and you got to flip them over and start doing, uh, you know, squats on them, I appreciated that. And even more so, to tell you why I appreciated that, the whole reason why Lash LaRue had a career in the first place is I went to the power plant on a whim. Mm. I didn't know anybody in the wrestling business. Nobody invited me out. I was sitting at home watching Monday Nitro that's in its infancy, just like everybody else. I'm watching the outsiders become a thing and NWO start to form. I'm watching Hulk Hogan, who was my childhood idol, turn heel. And now he's got all this heat going with it, right? And so I'm watching that, and a business is exploding, and WCW is showing the commercials for the power plant. And I'm sitting at home like anybody else would be that's a big fan that's ever been athletic in their life, and I'm going, you know, I don't think I'll ever make it, but I played sports in high school. I'm reasonably athletic. What a great story it would be just to go over it and try out man, and, and to experience that. Maybe I'll meet Sting and shake his hand or or maybe Ric Flair is hanging around the power plant that day, you know, styling know and profiling. Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't know what to expect. I just knew I'd been saying my prayers, eat my vitamins and training. No, but uh, so I met the criteria. I called them up, went over, did the three day tryout. And very, very quickly I show up and there's 24 guys in my tryout class and In that mix, you got guys that are bodybuilders, you know, that have tremendous physiques and are gassed to the gills, you know, and you've got guys that were these great college athletes and football players that are not quite good enough to make it to the NFL. And then you got guys that just think they have the look. They've got mohawks and tattoos and piercings, and they think I'm going to show up and they're going to think I have the look and they're going to sign me and put me on TV. But all these guys, Guys had the expectations that they were a ready-made wrestler. But they didn't and have the no, ethic, did they? They didn't have the ethic, man. And somebody like a Sarge, 
man, everybody was on a level playing field. And so it was the ultimate meritocracy, like playing sports in high school or something. Man, it doesn't matter who your parents are. If you get on the field and you knock the crap out of somebody else, right? They're going to put you in and you're going to be the starter. And so when Sarge says grab a bucket and everybody's got to grab a bucket, he didn't care if you were 6'6", 290 pounds with abs for days. If your legs were uh, cramping on you and you're falling out, then Sarge just looked at you and said, you know what? You called us. We didn't call you. You can leave if you can't do it. And very quickly, I went from feeling like I'm the underdog because I'm 18, 19 years old, barely old enough to even be trying out. And at the time, you know, I'm, I'm less than six foot. I'm 220 pounds of chewed bubble gum, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm looking around thinking, how am I going to compete with these guys? And suddenly I see them falling out and I see them not being able to go. Like I was just sharing with you guys, man, I grew up dirt poor. I lived in some houses that didn't have running water or electricity because we didn't afford the bill. I was homeless my junior or senior year of high school. I'd been through some struggles and I'd faced some adversity. And now suddenly I went from feeling like I'm the underdog to going, I, I've got the advantage. Yes. So while they're cramping and falling out, I knew I wasn't going to quit. You might run me off, but I'm not going to quit. So I'm doing squats and I'm marking out like I'm Ric Flair. I'm just going, woo, 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 while I'm squat just to try to up the psychological game a little bit more. And at the end of the first day, out of 24 guys, there's maybe 16 left. The next day, maybe eight show back up. And then at the end of that third day, and then going into uh, at the end of the second day, going into the third day, me and one other guy showed up the third. And even then, I don't know what happened to him because when the day's over, they take you into the office. Jody Hamilton, the original assassin, who I always thought looked like Winston Churchill, <laughs> sat behind his desk, would fold his hands over his stomach, and he'd go, look, kid, we don't promise you'll ever have a job. We're not promising you'll ever be on TV. We're not saying you're going to get a contract. The only thing that we're telling you is you've shown us that we, you've got what it takes to learn how to be a wrestler, and we'll give you an opportunity. You can pay us. We'll train you to be a wrestler. And that's, that was my foray into being at the power plant. There's no guarantees. You show yeah. up, you do the work, and you, you hope for the best. But like you said, you you do the work and do that's what I love and I appreciate. And I think like a lot of society and everything lacks nowadays is that old school mentality work for it. And not everybody, yeah. I'm sorry. The reality of life is not everybody gets a damn trophy, you know, not not everything's just handed to you, you know. And I think you get some of the best productivity out of whatever you're doing in life, you know, whether it's you know professional athlete, entertainer, or just a regular shoot job, you know, like I, I sell truck parts or whatever it is, you know, if yeah. you, if you go through the hard work and you put it in, man, I, that those are the people you can trust. And yeah, 100%, uh, 100%, the cream rises to the top passion pushes you through and perseveres. Yeah. And so it's, uh, that stuff has a way of just working itself out. And if you're, if you're hardworking, I've always been a firm believer of this. If you're hardworking, and you're willing to put in the hours and you're willing to put in the effort, the success finds you. The success finds you. If you've got any talent whatsoever, the success is going to find you. For sure, and then brother. At the, end of the day, at the end of the day, let's be honest about it. Maybe you're not the most talented person in the world, but that hard work is going to take you further than it ever would have taken you otherwise. And my mentality was, even when I started at the power plant, was even if this does not open up for me and it doesn't become this great opportunity, I'm going to be so far further along than say the average independent wrestler. Yes, because for sure. Because here I've been rubbing elbows with guys like this. Hello, dear listener. During this part of the interview with Lash LaRue, my internet took a crap and we lost some audio. It was only about 20 seconds and they were transitioning into talking about Canyon. So instead of giving you some awkward and weird transition, I give you this awkward and weird transition where we lost the context to how they got to talking about Canyon, but it's only about a few seconds of audio. Enjoy the rest of the show. Because the guy, dude, we had Brian Cage on the show, and he, dude, he was like a mentor to Cage. And so many other people so great. And I, I don't really think he was really appreciated until nowadays for the true talent and innovator that he was. 
Well, I think you're absolutely right in general, as far as the wrestling culture is concerned. I can promise you this for young guys coming in, Canyon was greatly appreciated. And, And the reason why is because you, I don't know what kind of mentor he was to Brian. I've never met Brian face to face. I'm sure Brian's got even, probably even more meaningful stories than I do. And I can tell you, Brian's experience was probably my experience, which is this: Chris did not care where you came from. He, he didn't care whether who you knew. He didn't care what you were doing right now in the wrestling business. He didn't care if you were over or not over. If you had a willingness to learn and you're respectful and appreciative of him, I'd never met anybody in the wrestling business who is more generous with his time as far as getting in the ring and working with you. And he was – you work ethic, we mentioned work ethic. Man, that dude was in the ring at the power plant almost every day that he wasn't on the road, even after he was a bona fide star in WCW as Mortis. And yeah. people talked about him being so innovative. The reason why he was able to be innovative is because he was constantly working with young talent and trying new moves and coming up with ideas. And, hey, do you think this might be able to work? And this is what a great talent – he was is I met Chris the first week that I was at the power plant to start my training. Now, when I say the first week, I mean, I have barely learned how to start taking bumps because when they brought you in the power plant, then for the tryout, you didn't mm-hmm. even get in the wrestling ring. It was all those notorious squats and push calisthenics <laughs> trying to break you down, man, because yes. their mentality was if wrestling is real and you do get hurt out there in the ring, they're not going to do this number. It's a live show. We've got to keep going. Yeah. So do you have the kind of heart that, well, I broke my arm. Okay. If it was a real fight, you'd break your arm in a real fight, weren't you? So you, you better have the heart to keep going and keep pushing through. That was their mentality at the time. And I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm just painting the landscape for where we were at the time in the business. And because of that mentality, K Fabe was still very much alive. They were still protecting mm-hmm. the business because they didn't know if I was going to come back and train and be a wrestler or not. And so once I did actually sign up as a trainee and come in and begin my training, I was barely into learning a headlock, learning to run the ropes and learning how to work the arm when Canyon came in and I met him for the first time. And uh, he got in the ring with me and, you know, in that Canyon way with his little lisp and everything. I said, hey, bro, let's have a match. <laughs> and I'm going, have a match? Man, I don't even know how to lock up barely. He goes, don't worry about it. Just listen to me. I'll walk you through it. And, man, he goes, you're a fan, aren't you? And I go, yeah. He goes, you know what the moves are, don't you? He goes, yeah. He goes, I'll protect myself. And we're having a match, and he is calling things for me. Like, when we get to heat spots, he's going to pile drive me. Pile drive you? Man, I, I barely know how to put you in a headlock. No, trust me. You don't have to do a pile drive. You've watched it on TV. Well, you know the mechanics of it. Right. As a wrestling fan, you've seen enough pile drivers. That right. You know but you want to protect to him, too. It. Yeah, you just want to know what you goes. Don't worry about it. I'll protect myself, bro. And he sure enough did. And that's the kind of amazing talent he was. And I left there that day, my first week, thinking to myself, I basically just had a match. And looking back, that was Canyon's way, too, of being able to fill you out. You know, he just based on that, he wasn't expecting it to be perfect. He wasn't expecting it to be smooth or flawless. He was able to tell right away whether or not I was going to have it, whether or not I was going to be good enough and coachable enough and, and athletic enough to be able to pull off them and listen and be able to pull off the moves that at the end of the day, I can, I can have matches and I, man, that's so invaluable. My confidence skyrocketed after that, you know, oh, yeah. and he, Tanya was just that dude. And he was the guy that everybody else called on to make them better. You know, the reason why they're such good friends with Paige is because they have a legitimate friendship there. Don't get me wrong. 100% they had a genuine brotherhood there. But Dally also knew, too, that Chris is going to come in and, man, he can help me out immeasurably with structuring matches and putting them together and working with me, training with me, helping me figure this out, figure that out. He was just the guy, man. He was the workhorse. And he'd call you and invite you to things to his house and invite you over and, and you know, include you is probably the best way to say it. In a yeah. business that excludes a lot of people, especially if you're not over yet, he was that guy that didn't care where you were on the totem pole. He wanted to include you. Super awesome. This is such a great guy, and he'll he'll always be missed, man. It's such a tragedy what happened with him. Um, yes, absolutely it is. Going back to like, I guess I guess you would call it like your your class 
Was there anybody else um, notable that came out or appeared on TV that got some time in WCW that trained down there with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I had, I had a good number of peers, and it's funny you're asking this question because this is not something that's widely talked about right. uh, recently. Uh, but uh, Alan Funk has a podcast now. I saw Kiwi. I don't know if you guys know Alan or not. He was Kiwi. Yeah, uh, in CW. I'm friends Great with him on talent. Facebook. Yeah, okay. Great guy, great talent. He's got a podcast. And uh, there was an informal group that came together, and they decided they wanted to recognize some guys that they didn't feel would ever get the recognition they deserved in the wrestling business. And they started some kind of informal. And to this day, I, they're anonymous as far as I know, but they started an informal uh, WCW Power Plant Hall of Fame. And, I mean, with rings and in the whole deal, right? And that's not something that we widely publicize because I get it. Look, the average wrestling fan and probably the average wrestler is going to collectively roll their eyes and go, uh, power fight, power fight. But for us to have gone through what we went through and to make it, even through the power plant, let alone them be on TV, created yeah. this brotherhood, this boot camp mentality that we came through when nobody else could came. And we did something that there's a lot of guys that are even bona fide stars in the wrestling business could not have gone through what we went through at the power plant. And because of that, we share this special bond. And because of that, that accolade means a lot to me, whether it ever means anything to anybody else in the business or not, doesn't matter to me because it means something to me and to the guys that came through there with me. And some of those guys that were my contemporaries at the time were guys like Alan Funk and guys like Rick Cornell and guys like Jamie Noble and guys yep. like Mike Sanders and, yep. and Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare and uh man i'm gonna i'm gonna leave some guys out that were coming through Lodi, you know uh, all these guys that kind of came through at the exact same time and are at least close close to the same time uh johnny swinger was another one you know yeah he's uh, he's been on the show too awesome dude yeah you know robbie rage you hell know, yeah got out to show it robbie rage and uh and you know and, and those guys and kenny chaos and, and, and even, oh, and I certainly can't forget, still, still a dear friend of mine now, Del Torbor, you know. Who, yes, who dude, he was a strength and conditioning here. coach for my favorite baseball team, the White Sox, yeah! Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. And so, yeah, and, and he and I had a conversation, what we were just talking about with those Hall of Fame rings, man. He's going, dude, you know, he's he's got World Series rings for being an NLB and being strength and conditioning coach. And I promise you, this means as much to him as that does just because it encapsulates this era in our lives that we yeah. shared together, you know, and because of that, we'll always be brothers and we'll always be close friends. And in this past October, after being flying under the radar for almost 10, 12 years, I was a ghost on social media and everything. When I retired from wrestling, I walked away and retired. I mean, I hid behind the sunset. I didn't just walk off in the sunset. <laughs> and even so, man, so I, I reconnected with guys like Mike Sanders and, and Alan Funk first and then Del Torborg uh, last fall and last winter. And then I started talking to those guys again. And then the door opened up for me to do the time limit draw. And I kind of dipped my toe back into the wrestling community a little bit, for lack of a better way of putting it, because of that. And I'd forgotten how much so much of that meant to me, man. And it's just an important time in my life. And it really set the stage for everything in my life. Yeah, brother. And dude, it set the stage for a lot of things. You look at the the PC now and WWE, the Performance Center. Yes. For me, there there isn't that without, you know, the power plant. It, it was way ahead of its time. Like WCW was so big and, you know, it was like almost the exact setup. You know, don't get me wrong. I've never been. I've seen inside the Performance Center and videos and shit, but I've never been down there. But it is the same idea that WCW had and look at the stars that they've been able to crank out for WWE through that, you know, like same yeah. deal, man. It's, it's fucking nuts, dude. And, and you're talking about the camaraderie, the brotherhood, dude, that's, that's so awesome to hear because like, I mean, that's something like me and Stratton have just in meeting each other and doing this show, which is essentially how we met and became friends and then bonded over that. And, you know, music and different stuff, you know, throughout the, four years i think it's been now that we've been doing this so i dude i totally get where you're coming from man the, the brotherhood 
That's a fucking yeah. strong feeling, and it's a good but feeling. You, you think about it like this, man. Uh, you got to think about it from this perspective. Even if you broke into the wrestling business and you broke in in a little independent company, right? So what are they running? Maybe once a week if they're lucky, once yeah. every two weeks. Yeah. You know, maybe even some of these places can only run once a month. So these guys may be your closest friends, but you're seeing them you know, a half a dozen times a month or something like that, you know, even with training and that sort of thing. And you've got a day job, they've got a day job. We were living it at the power plant. So even the guys that weren't quite on the level of being on the road yet and weren't really being used or in the mix, we had our own little mix there at the power plant. We were expected to be there every day. We're putting in our eight, 10 hours every day. And we're seeing each other every day. So, man, we're clocking in, we're clocking out. We're spending that time time together in the ring and in that way we had as much time in the ring together as guys like you know like dare i say guys like an eddie guerrero and a dean malenko and a chris benoit who spent all this time together in japan on tours and yeah they had a lot of ring time together but i promise you we had just as much ring time together every day five days a week 365 days a year you know year in and year out for whatever time we were at the power plant uh, tell you a quick funny story, man. It was just awesome, and it, it, it spoke to to my heart. For like, you know, at the risk of sounding cheesy, I, I saw Mike Sanders for the first time in, gosh, probably twelve years, if not longer than that, man. You know what? I bet it. I bet it was longer than that, man, because I saw him last fall, maybe 2021, 2020, 2020 probably. I saw. Him for the first time in 15 years, because I bet it had been 2005 or something since I had seen him. Yeah. And this dude, we came into the power plant very, very close around the same time. Our first trip to really have a WCW match was back when WCW would do the syndicated tapings down in Orlando, or Orlando Studios. And the word was kind of out that if you wanted to put forth the effort, man, grab your gear, get in your car, drive down to Orlando, Tell the bookers, hey, you're from the power plant. If they need a guy, you've got some gear and you're ready to go. And you can get an opportunity that way. And both of us got our first matches that way. And uh, we traveled down there together. And while we're heading down there, I've always been kind of a creative guy. And I had this idea for kind of a – where he's trying to come up with a character, right? I had a pretty good handle on who I wanted to be. And Mike's trying to come up with a character. And we were having so much fun heading down to Orlando – going to Florida, listening to Jimmy Buffett while we're riding in his Jeep with the top down on the open interstate. And we got our shirts off, getting some sun while we're traveling. We're young guys, man. And I start telling him, I go, man, why don't you do like a Jimmy Buffett beach dude type of character? You know, you could be Jimmy Ocean, right? <laughs> Call yourself Jimmy Ocean. And here's how you can look different. You can either wear like a Hawaiian shirt and some board shorts and some of those soft shoes like people swim in. You know, because that's the difference. <laughs> yeah. Somebody wrestles in those. And then I go, or you can wear like a wetsuit, you know, that deal. And carry like, if you were a heel, you could carry a boogie board with you because the surfboard's too big to carry to the ring. And you could hit hit somebody with that or whatever you want to do. So I'm coming up with all these ideas and just throwing them out at it. And, and we're, we're talking it through and just laughing about it, man. And I come back home and because I'm an artist, I draw up these character sheets with that character on it and do the whole Jimmy Ocean thing and the whole deal. And I give it to him, man. That dude, when I saw him, after 15, 16, 17, 18 years, he brought me a copy. He still had it. He still had it all those years later, man. Even though he never did anything with it, even though it was never anything, man, that meant something to me. You know, yeah. That's the kind of bonding and time that we spent together. That stuff doesn't just go away. And you can't just manufacture that with somebody for the first time you meet them. Yeah, dude, that's that's super cool, man. So it's I'll water under forget. the bridge, man. It's water under the bridge, right? I never forget that. Uh, man, what did he do? He did a. Uh, oh man, there was some promo with me and Gene. I think it was on Nitro, and dude, it was awesome. Bro, <laughs> me and Gene's like kind of talking shit, but they were going back and forth, tit for tat, dude. But it's uh, it's just one of the greater moments. I remember like one of these promos he cut when he was uh, what was it? The uh, what was that group he was a part of? The natural born thrillers. Natural born thrillers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> me and yeah. Gene's just like and those were 
love the power plant guys, man. Just trying to finally get in a spot, you know, and he was, he was the mouth for him. Rick Cornell, Reno, you know, those guys. And yeah. a lot of that carried over. Jin Drack and O'Hare, man. Do what? Jin Drack and O'Hare as well. Yes. Absolutely. Chuck Palumbo, you know, the guys that you mentioned yep. that I thought was, uh, it, that's the shit that kind of bothers me is, you know, and this is kind of some, a good segue to, um, man, WCW had some really, really great fucking young talent that had things been managed a little better, you know, who knows you guys would have still been around today because a lot of those cats went on to do, you know, other things and whether it's in WWE and maybe that botched invasion angle bullshit, but uh, dude, I just, I had mad respect for a lot of those young dudes coming out because it, you finally got to see Goldberg was a WCW product, right? Stings. Yeah. The, those were full fledged, you know, they weren't plucking these guys, your Hogan's and your macho man's and, and putting them in, in WCW. These were home they were homegrown. talent, yeah. homegrown. And there, and there were, a, and they had Jericho, who was another one that they, uh, uh, mind boggling how he got away, you know, I mean, and it, that was the case with a lot of those guys. And it's just, it's sad to see, but I know, you know, what I, I guess my question for you is when Vince Russo came in and he was trying to put, you know, do the whole new blood thing and put, you know, his spin on. And basically he wanted to promote the younger talent because a lot of people give Russo shit. But I mean, I'll always give him credit for he was right. I mean, but at the same time, I think he was the way he went about it was wrong because it's basically like, all right, everybody who's made money in this business. Get the fuck out, you know, and here's these guys. I don't think it was the right way of going about it. And then I didn't really care for the whole, well, here's the new blood and here's the millionaires club. You just, you're making these guys sound like old and, and dated and stuff. Like it's people know people knew Hogan was an older cat and Randy and all those guys. But there was, you know, if you look at like how AEW does their stuff now and what sting is doing at the ripe old age of what, like 64, 63, he's been booked amazingly. You know, yeah. like yeah. that is that's like I said, WCW could have done that. But uh, what was your experience like with uh, Russo running the ship? All right. Uh, uh, a, a fun antidote. And then I'll get in to answer your question. A little fun antidote. We were talking at the outset about how I had this weird gift, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, where I always looked old for my age when I was younger. And I look young for my age as I get older. Right. <laughs> well, early on, I don't know if you'll remember this or not. Uh, but when they started that angle and it was the millionaires club or the older guys against the younger guys, somehow I got stuck with the older guys. Yeah. And, and that was one of the youngest guys in the, in the company. I don't know if you remember that or not. They stuck me with the older guys because I just, I had more of a traditional feel to me, I guess. You, you must have that big of, money contract, right? <laughs> right, uh. right? Yeah. Yeah. I wish, but I, I guess I was kind of a throwback in styles to, to those older guys. Guys, you know, and I guess I had kind of an old school feel to me, but I can remember vividly at the time being younger than Ray Mysterio Jr. and being younger than Disco, and being younger than Billy Kidman, being younger than all these guys that were considered the young guys. But anyway, that was always funny to me. With that being said, to answer your question more directly, first with Russo and, and, and WCW, I admired and appreciated what he was trying to do. I especially admired and appreciated it was the first time somebody took an interest in me from management, you know, that so a writer came in and said, Hey, we like what you're doing and we think you've got talent. And these are some specific ideas we have for you before then it would show up to a building. Who am I wrestling tonight? And just go out and have a great match. So yeah. it was nice having that kind of attention paid to me, but at the same time, you know, we had towards the end there, we had a pretty big roster and we had a lot of talent and it wasn't uncommon for you to be booked on, if you were someone like me and was in the mix, but not necessarily a, a one of the main guys, for you to come to a show and, and you be booked on Nitro and you're booked on everything, but you just don't have a match that night. And I can remember vividly, right at that time there where there was a lot of tension between specifically Billy Kidman, somebody like a Billy Kidman who was getting over and was considered a hot young star. And I think they were worried about losing him because – if I have my timeline correctly, I think they had just lost Jericho. And, yeah. and they're, they're thinking, oh, okay, yeah. are we going to bleed some other talent, you know, if we're not careful? So they were trying to give someone like a Billy Kidman a chance, and they were letting him get that rub with Hulk Hogan. 
you know, and he and Hogan ran a little bit of a program. Yeah, the F-U-N-B, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so, you know, it was during that time, and I'm not saying it was that particular angle, but it was during that time that I got to a Nitro, and I was I was booked for the show but wasn't on the show, or I was supposed to wrestle someone like a Hoovitude, and he was hurt or something, and he got bumped. So me having the night off, so to speak, I was still at a point in my career where I could take my hair, pull up the old man bud, stick it under a cap, go out there and sit and enjoy the, the show. And I went up and sat in the nosebleed seat, seats, and I said, you know, I just want to watch it from a fan's perspective tonight. Right. And from a fan's perspective, you would have these guys come out all night long on Nitro, and, and the crowd would pop, and the crowd was going crazy because the business was great. Mm-hmm. Then Hogan came out. And, dude, it was a whole different level. And that's not me trying to make excuses. That's not me. I'm just telling you the facts of what I experienced. And it hit me in that moment for all the young guys that were complaining about this ceiling that was in, that they felt was there at WCW, you know, with the main event guys. My mentality was, until you're getting that level of a superstar pop, how can you argue with the business aspect of wanting Hogan to be your main event guy? Now, with that being said, you definitely got to build that young talent because he can't be there forever and he can't be the top guy forever. And you've got to start working those other guys in. But with, but you can't also can't argue with Hogan still being the main event guy if he's getting he's, that kind of reaction from fans. He's fucking Babe Ruth of pro wrestling. Sure. That's right. That's right. And so that also opened up my perspective later. And, and as I get older, the more I look at – back on my career with a lot clearer eyes than what I did in the moment, you know, because you're young, you're young, you're, you're a A lot older, but yet younger eyes. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. So you're, uh, but, but you you look back, man, and, and you think in the moment there, you don't realize you don't know what you don't know. And at that time, I didn't know enough to know what I didn't know. So I I can look back on my career and I can see where I was susceptible to the same kind of arrogance that a lot of those guys were that WCW gets bought and we go to WWE. Okay. You've signed me to a contract and I'm one that you called, you called me up and you said, good news, bad news, bad news. Go ahead. Let me ask you this Lash, not to cut you off, but um, so after, after the purchase, you, uh, from what I understand, you had what, like a three-year developmental deal. No. And see, that was another thing that kind of, and, and again, this is the reason some of these things build up some animosity that really didn't have to be there. And it's mm. not really anybody's fault. It's just young guys not knowing the business and, and being the victim of what's going on in the business around you. Right. Because I got a call at the time, right after the purchase was made, and it was Johnny Ace, you know, hey, Lash, we got good news, we got bad news. All right, John, well, give me the bad news first. I'm a bad news first guy. You know, yeah, right, yeah. the bad news is that Vince is only interested in 24 guys. Okay, what's the good news? Good news is you're one of them. Wonderful. Great. But what do I need to do? Well, you don't need to do anything right now. He's just going to assume your WCW contract. Because, again, it's not like I'm one of those heavy hitters. You know? Right. I, I, had a, I had a reasonable contract at the time. And so I, I sat home for another four weeks after that waiting on the next call. I got the next call, and it was, uh, look, Vince wants you to go up to Cincinnati and knock the ring rust off at their developmental area up there for about four weeks until they come up with a reason to bring you back out on TV or, or a storyline or whatever else. That's what I was told. At the time. Okay, fine. You know, cool. Uh, I assume you guys are going to send me an airline ticket, you know, since it's eight-hour drive. Yeah. They go, well, you might want to drive your car up there because, you know, that'll save you from getting a rental car and the whole deal. I go, sure, no problem. And I was always an easygoing guy with that sort of thing. Then right before I'm going to leave, they called me back again and they said, uh, look, Vince wants you to sign a WWE contract because the WWE contracts are structured different from the WCW contracts. The WCW contract that I had was a guaranteed set amount, yeah. no matter what, per year, right? WWE was going to be less on the downside but the upside is supposed to be unlimited. And the way that it was sold to me was, look, you're one of our workhorses in WCW. There's no reason to think you're not going to be that in WWE. And if you work as hard for us in WWE as you did in WCW, you're going to make three times as much money as you made in WCW. To which my answer was, look, I'm living a dream. As long as I'm paying my bills, and I'm reasonably comfortable. I'm not yeah. trying to be greedy here. So, yeah, sure, whatever you guys want me to sign, send it. 
They sent me a new deal. I signed a three-year contract with them that was not a developmental deal. It was a talent contract. Okay. But because they sent me up to Cincinnati, and because I'm not a squeaky wheel, and because I'm not somebody that complains, and I wasn't somebody that was politicking and calling them constantly and going, okay, when are you going to bring me on TV like you promised? And I was never that guy, and I never wanted to be that guy. You know, I was always taught it's that Sarge mentality. Let me work hard. Let me do my job. And you recognize how hard I'm working and you reward me accordingly, right? right. I feel, in my opinion, that's how life should work. But, you know, the problem was they were so saturated with talent, so saturated with talent. I used to take it personally that I got left up in Cincinnati and four weeks turned into nine months. Mm. And I'm having to pay for an apartment up there while I'm sending my money back home because I still have a house back here and a family that I'm having right. to fund. And I'm having to pay my mortgage. I'm making a tenth of what I made in WCW. And I'm not getting any of that extra money I was promised because even though I'm working seven days a week and I'm having to train at their training center up there or their work their territory up there, those aren't considered WWE shows. So I'm only getting my downside and nothing more than that. All this stuff starts to build in some animosity and some bitterness, you know, and you look around and you start feeling like you're being mistreated. Because you and some of the contemporaries that we just were talking about, yep. some of those power plant type guys or some of these guys that have actually been on TV and been established, you're you're packing them in, four people in a one-bedroom apartment to save money while you're watch, flipping over and there's a new show on TV called Tough Enough and they've got kids that have never done anything in the business staying in a mansion. You know, it builds up animosity. Now, yeah, I, yeah. now I have the perspective of looking back from a business standpoint going, well, that was good TV and it got ratings. It made money for WWE. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that's not the position I was in as a talent at the time. You, you know what I mean? Uh, the same way, brother, you look back and and now I can look back on site 2020 and going, dude, they had at least a dozen world champions under contract at the time. Guys that had held a heavyweight title in a major company. Yeah. And they didn't have space for them. Why am I taking it so personally that they didn't have room for me on a two-hour TV show or right. a three-hour TV show? Makes perfect sense, but it's very easy to get caught up in a victim mentality at that time. And and I think the the overarching shame to kind of tie this up in a neat little bow, hopefully, of what went on during that time is what you were just mentioning about some of these guys, like a Sean O'Hare and a Mark Jinderak and a Chuck Palumbo, and, and some of these guys that may have got a little bit of a taste, but they didn't get a lot of time. I feel like. My generation of wrestlers, because every wrestling, you know, wrestling has these generations that come in and come out. Yeah. I feel like there's a lost generation of wrestlers that never quite were given the opportunity to hit their prime. Guys like me, man, that, that and, and, and you go, okay, well, what did, the, what did the business really miss because of that? Well, the business missed that now you've leapfrogged. You've jumped from that generation that is, say, Stone Cold and The Rock and, and, and Billy Gunn and Triple H and Road Dogg, Jesse James, and those guys, and DX, and Shawn Michaels, and Bret Hart, that generation leapfrogged from that generation to, to these guys with CM Punk and John Cena and yeah. these guys Batista, coming in. Yeah. And Batista. And, and, and where, where that hurts the wrestling business is you want to have that crossover in between because there are going to be guys that rise up to the top that can work with these younger talents. You don't want to be caught where you have the older generation is, is a little past their prime and can't quite go at the level that the younger generation can, that they're passing the torch to. Yeah. While at the same time, if the, all the younger generation does is work with each other, then they get stagnant as well. And, and, and they're not learning some of the old school stuff that can be mixed in the new, new style and make it something totally different and, and, and totally bigger than it was before. Yeah. And dude, going back to what I said, like about what AEW does with the stinger, you know, now yes. and how they're doing exactly what you're saying. They're combining these generations and the, the knowledge and the wealth and the work rates are all being shared. And I think everybody involved in what they're doing right now is going to benefit greatly from that. And not only that, like if you're a genuine, true pro wrestling fan and not just some asshole that sits behind a keyboard and shits on everything because your life sucks. It's you're going to it's going to pay off big time because you're going to have the entertainment there. You're going to have people who can go people that, OK, we're going to take Stinger. He's he's limited. Right. But yet 
you still see these crazy spots and these moments where, what is he, like 63, 65-year-old man's like jumping off the balcony still. And here I am like reliving the Monday Night Wars like, oh, my God, yeah, yeah. I see you again. And threatening a guy, a jaded pro wrestling fan who has come <laughs> back and, and, and sees this stuff and gets excited on Wednesday nights because it's it's done the right way, man. It's it's a melting pot of goodness, you know, like a lot of those guys do to especially do, I loved Jin Drac and O'Hare as a tag team in WCW was amazing because they were two big cats that were young, had great looks, but they could go. They could really go. You were another guy doing so many guys that could really go. And it, it was just such a shame. And, and the thing that sucks is you were just a, uh, how, how would you put this, uh, verbalize this, um, a casualty of, of war, so to speak, of, of a buyout. A lot of ECW guys, too. I mean, because let's not forget, it wasn't just WCW. It was the, the two and three major wrestling promotions in the U.S., we're gone. It was a weird time, dude. In 2001, I, that's the year I graduated high school, man. As a wrestling fan, I was like in tears the night WCW went under. I was like, man, it, this is it. Wrestling's going to suck now. It's it's a monopoly by a guy that, yeah, did he give us our childhood memories? Yes. But now he's got way too much to work with, and I don't think he's really got what it takes, and his group has what it takes to or even really give a damn about like, yeah, because they're always going to look at you guys as you were the competition and not really give you the opportunities that you deserved. You know, look at all these guys, Goldberg's first run um, with the company when Sting finally came to WWE, how many years later and did a job at mania, his one and only mania makes sense, right? No, I don't think it does. Uh, and, and shit like that. It just, ugh. ah, well, let, let me let me bail you out a little bit on that and, 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 and add a little extra perspective, a little extra layer of perspective do. that may affirm some of the things that you're saying. Because I said for a long time, I said, yeah, absolutely. I was a prisoner of the ratings war, exiled to not Siberia, but Cincinnati, you know, which, which, which <laughs> I was just there this weekend, the brother. Thing. The Waffle House sucks out there. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. But uh but yeah, and so there was a lot of casualties because of that. And that's what I refer to now as that lost generation of wrestlers. And, and so I have kind of a theory about that. I think that I may be wrong on this. I, I certainly am not going to pretend that I can take someone like this man and all the stuff that he has done in the business and be able to read his mind. Right. But my perspective tells me now, I think, I think this is a theory. This is a working hypothesis that I've not <laughs> shared with anybody. But my theory is this. I think that if Vince had it to do over, he wouldn't have bought WCW. He wouldn't have bought his competition. I think it had more to do with him being able to affirmatively end the ratings war and be able to go out the victor than it was about what will this do to the landscape of the business for the next 25 years. And the reason yeah. why I say that is I think that he's become smarter because of it. And my evidence of that, if you will, is – when you saw these rounds of layoffs and cuts and stuff that WWE makes, mm -hmm. and they go, I can't believe they got rid of somebody like a Bray Wyatt, you know, or, right, right. or whoever it is, right? And people are going, what is Vince thinking? Is he losing his mind? And why is he cutting these people? Why is he cutting that people? I think Vince is not as worried as he was during the height of the ratings war of somebody jumping ship to the quote unquote competition as he was before, if he's not using them. And the reason why is because I think you see from a business perspective, what hurt the business more than anything else was now you suddenly didn't have any competition anymore. Yeah. You know, part of what stop watching. Interest is competition, right? It's easier mm -hmm. for you to promote pizza hut. When you've got top you got uh, Domino's to kind of go head to head again. It's hard to to argue for Coke versus Pepsi or anything else like that, right? Or down yeah. here to the south, you got Waffle House and you got Huddle House. CBS right? go and ahead. Walgreens, brother. Yeah. So you know, yeah, competition has a tendency to breed interest. What it also does is it forces everybody to have to work a little bit harder and get a little bit better. And I think he's smart enough to recognize and realize that you know what? If we take someone like for lack of a better way of, uh, of someone else to pluck out of thin air. If you take someone like a Cody Rhodes, and you say, we really don't, don't know how to utilize him properly and make him a main event star. 
let him go. Let's see what he does. If he has talent, if he has ability, if he has what we think he has, and he is truly Dusty Rhodes' son, then he's going to rise to the top of the food chain. He certainly did that. And Vince knows that he has the ability and the means and the resources to come back in and pluck that talent back up after it's been cultivated in a different ground. Right. Yes. Because you can get stagnant as well. If you, we talked about the uh, performance center down there, you know, mm-hmm. one of the knocks against that is it's difficult for everybody not to come out looking like they're sharing similar looks and similar style and similar ring gear and similar presence because they're training together every day. Of course, they're going to influence one another that way. When you take someone out of that environment and you send them over here, or maybe they find a niche for themselves in Japan, or maybe they go over to Germany and they have a good run in Germany, they pick up these little things, or maybe they're from the South, so they're wrestling the independent scene predominantly in front of a Southern crowd, or maybe they're from the Midwest and they're wrestling, which is a totally different style, predominantly in front of the Midwestern crowd, or maybe Northeastern. All these things cause you to evolve and learn a few tricks here and there that get sprinkled into who you are. And when Vince brings you back in, you're a more well-rounded talent than you were before. And he's got a better product because of it than he had before. Yes, dude. (laughs) Everybody wins in that. Everybody wins. You said that really well. Educating all the people out in the JP Wu, all the ladies and gentlemen, dude, that's, that's <laughs> a great point, man, because Cody came, he did exactly that. And he is the son of a son of a plumber. If you he will. Is, baby. He is, baby. <laughs> and here's the flip side of that. The flip side of that is this one of my perspective moments. And that's become a big word for me as I'm, you know, getting older is I'm right. looking back on my life with a different perspective. And one of the things I'm recognizing is I feel like without being overly arrogant and just being as objective as I can be, I Mm. think that I can say that I was a good worker. You know, I feel like I was a good talent. I was a good worker. I feel like I always had good matches. I feel like you put me in a wrestling ring and that was my home. I'm not going to sit there and pretend that I was some big superstar, that I was the super over guy or that I can go around with any kind of arrogance or grovel. But I do believe that most wrestlers that worked with me or around me, if you ask them if Lash LaRue was a good worker, they would give me that kind of credibility. I, I think I can say that on safe ground. With that being said, one of my frustrating points now looking back at the time that I lost, the 10, 15 years where I was away from the business, I realized it took this long for me to realize I never learned the business. Right. I knew how to work. Right. I knew ring psychology. I knew the psychology of the business. I knew how to go out there and get over. I knew how to structure great matches, put great matches together. But we weren't taught the wrestling business. Why? Because, number one, it wasn't needed during that time because you're not in the territory. You don't have to figure out how to get yourself booked. You're under contract. They tell you where you've got to be and when you've got to be there. They tell you who you're wrestling and what the angle is and what the storyline is. You Mm -hmm. don't have to fill those things out for yourself. You don't have to fill out – figure out how to draw a crowd because the machine has drawn the crowd for you. You just have to produce a great match for them for good TV. So with all that being said, what happens is when you're on the outside of that, you're looking in, you recognize, you realize, man, I don't know a thing about the wrestling business. Right. Uh, how do I, how do I get myself back out there? And how do I get booked? And, and, and how do I, you know, rub elbows with other promoters and, and set up a schedule for myself so that I'm booked on a regular basis and constantly growing. And I think there was a lot of wrestlers that were so frustrated that they just gave up on the business because they didn't know how to handle the business. Yeah, They knew how to have great matches if you called them, but they didn't know what to do while they're sitting at home and not getting called. Right, right. And, and dude, they, as soon as Cody left, dude, I mean, he's, you know, he's got Kevin Owens saying, hey, Hook you up with, get a hold of Matt and Nick. Here's their number, Young Bucks. You know, these guys will set you straight. He goes to ROH. He goes to New Japan, you know, does the Bullet Club thing. And I'll, I'll put it to you this way. When he was, uh, his first run, WWE, I, was, I wasn't a fan. I mean, I'll just be honest. I wasn't a fan. Yeah. But it was great to watch the evolution of him because when he left and started doing everything he was doing and hitting Impact and all these indie dates and stuff, I became a damn fan because I'm like, you know sure. what? Dude, you're it's it's like watching a flower grow, like blossom in front of your eyes. Like you you've seen, yes, he is the son of Dusty Rhodes, and he's he's proven it. And now 
you know, to have that run with, you know, the competition, so to speak, in AEW and being the EVP and the American Nightmare and this whole, he was a big deal. So for him to yeah. go back, which I think was always in the cards for him, you of know, course like, it was. Of and the storyline's very real that he's telling right now that this is the one thing that my family was denied was the WWE championship, you know, like he wants that. He is the patriarch of the Rhodes family now, you know, like it's it's great storytelling. But here's the thing, brother, it's real. And and you Absolutely. always feel that with Cody. He's so articulate. His, his stories, it's always it hits you right in, you know, right in the heart, man, like. Damn it, Cody. <laughs> like, I'm trying not to like you because you jump ship. But, ah, ah. All right. Man. So so how about this? How about this for talking up the business for us? Right. If we will speak from a fan's perspective. And I mm-hmm. think the barometer is this is exactly that. It's the fan's perspective, because I don't care what the numbers come out to be when you start talking about ratings and that sort of thing, or even by rates or even what the gate is. I can put my finger on the pulse of culture and I can say I feel wrestling made making a resurgence and it yeah. does my heart good. You can just kind of feel it. It's palpable, right? Yes. Yes. And I think what the young generation did that I can appreciate so much. I'm never going to be the old guy that's shaking his fist and going, if they only did it like they did it in my day, you know, never going to be that guy. Yeah. What I think they did do is you take your Cody's and you, you take your guys like that, Kenny Omega and the young bucks and how they went out and made a thing for themselves. Part of the reason why they were able to skirt the industry and reimagine the industry is because they grew up in this time of social media, right? They grew yeah. up in this time of connectivity that we didn't have. I didn't right. know how to connect with, with other promoters. I just didn't. If you weren't from the Alabama area and you weren't a promoter calling me and you didn't find my number, I, they don't have a yellow pages for that. <laughs> they just didn't. You know? <laughs> what are yellow pages? Yeah. My fingers did the walking and I didn't find anything. So, you know, and I couldn't put it in my Google machine. So, you know, so you're kind of on the outside looking in, but these guys have taken all those tools that that connectivity gives you and they used it to build these almost their own social media web, for lack of a better way to put it, right? Where they've connected with whether it's Japan and their resources over there, whether it's doing the Bullet Club thing and you can go out to like a hot topic and see a Bullet Club t shirt in there. <laughs> It's like amazing. They're doing their own mm-hmm. merchandising. They got their own. They got their own trading cards. They got their own dolls. They've got their own merchandising. There's action they're, figures. Damn it! Yeah. They, well, look. They've almost built up their own promotion or business without even owning a promotion or a business. Yeah. And so, from a business standpoint, these guys have turned the industry up on top of its head. Where I think that they could use a little bit more help. If if. For, for what it's worth, coming from the old timer that's been out of the business for 10 or 12 years. But here's something that I recognize that I think has been a hindrance, that if we can figure out this magic sauce, suddenly the business skyrockets again, and we see those glory days that we had enjoyed so much in the late 90s. And that's this. My generation, I feel, was the last generation that had the opportunity of entering into the business when we still thought the business was real. Like I just shared with you about how kayfabe was not broken yet. And kayfabe was still being held to, even when I went through the power plant, they weren't going to let me in on the inside until they knew for a fact I'm training. So I still even had, as a wrestler, I had to question whether or not it was real, let alone as a fan. Right. Well, here's the interesting perspective that gives you. If you are a wrestler and you grew up believing that the wrestling business is real, even once you find out it's a work, you work your matches in a different style because you're wrestling as if you think it's real. Uh, whether you, whether that makes sense or not, you really truly are. Your mentality is, I really got a chance to win this every title. This is awesome, right? And, and so the, the reality in, in the fantasy blur a little bit there. The storylines and what's real and what's not real blurs, and you wrestle that match that way. That's why you feel those old school matches between a, a Bret Hart and a Shawn Michaels. They're wrestling as if it's real. And yeah. when you're chasing a title as if it real, as if it's real, well, Ric Flair, you can't convince me that Ric Flair doesn't think it means something to be the heavyweight champion of the world. Obviously, he does. It, the belt is not a prop to Ric Flair. It's not. It is the prestigious title in all of sports, not just in wrestling, right? That's the way Flair's mentality has always been, and it's made us believe it as fans. I think we have a generation of wrestlers, for what it's worth, we have a generation of wrestlers, for what it's worth, that have grown up 
being told that wrestling's entertainment. And it's been drilled. Thank you for not head. dropping any f bombs, by the way, on the show because we bleep people out for dropping f bombs. <laughs> well, there, there you go. So, so that's that's the other thing. So, so they've been told, yeah, they, they've been taught that uh, that that wrestling's just entertainment. They've been taught that the belt is nothing but a prop. They've been taught that you know who who wins the matches is who the company says wins the matches, and they tweet, they do social media. They interact with fans that way. In fact, the only person I have seen do that differently and mad respect to him for it is I see little video clips all the time of MJF when he's interacting with fans and doing autographs <laughs> and he's healing out on them like a heel. God forbid a heel. Dude, he's like, like flicking off around. little kids and shit. Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw a clip of him yesterday. This this girl walks up to him and she's drawn this portrait of him. And he sees it, and for a split second, you can kind of see it flash in his eyes how much he appreciates this, and he's great. But he stops, and he goes, so how long did you spend on this? And she's like, five hours. And he just takes a magic marker and starts marking over it and sets it back over to the side. And But but he's being a heel. Right? So my point is this. You can't expect the fans to treat it like it's real if we, as the talent and as the wrestlers, don't treat it like it's real. Yeah. If, if the belt doesn't mean something to me when it comes to getting an opportunity to win the heavyweight title at, say, WrestleMania, if that's not huge, if that's not the biggest moment in my life, why are you going to buy a ticket or buy the pay-per-view as if it's the biggest moment in your life? You know, it, it, it turns into instead you're sitting at home trying to guess who the bookers are going to put on. Yeah, and that's that's it's not fun. You know, I mean, it's always no. it's cool to speculate as a fan, but when you get like a lot of the quote unquote wrestling community, the IWC, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're very toxic like that nowadays. There's too much focus on that. It's like, hey, motherfucker, go get a billion dollars, start your own company, and then let's see what happens. You know, you're gonna fall flat on your ass because you don't know anything about the business. And yeah. I don't think you really appreciate wrestling as much as you think you are. You're not a real fan like you think you are. You know, like because it's almost you're not talking about the matches anymore. At that point, you're not talking about the matches. You're talking about the way it was booked. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's yeah. They talk about they talk about what would they have booked it that way or how they would have done the storyline differently. They're really not talking that much about the matches. And hey, in their defense and in the fans defense, you know, I see a lot of wrestlers too falling into that same uh, to, into a similar uh, issue where they'll have matches where, you know, they do these crazy, ridiculous, awesome moves that look tremendous, and then they win with a roll-up. You know, I get that you're going to have that kind of shocking moment and surprise ever so often, right. but I see that way too often. You know, I see that in too many matches. You have these big builds up, and then you have these great high spots and these great movements, and, and everything looks great, but it's not really being sold as properly and as well as it could be sold. And then you come back and give you an example of what I thought was just phenomenal storytelling. You talk about great storytelling. I saw a match between, uh, I want to say it was Ric Flair and a very, very, very young Jake to Steak Roberts. Mm. And I retweeted this little clip because all it was was a clip. It was less than 30 seconds. Flair's coming into the territory. He's got to take on their top baby face, which is Jake Roberts at the time. He mm -hmm. gets in Jake Roberts' face, who's wearing a T-shirt and like Zuba pants or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So he's making fun of his gear, and he's almost – the, the, he's pantomiming, you don't look like a real wrestler, basically, is what I'm getting from it, right? Poking mm -hmm. him and poking the bear, and they're poking each other, and he's shoving Flair. Flair's shoving him back. All the while, the referee has not even started the match yet. And so Flair does something. Jake has had enough, and he DDTs him. And Flair is yes. out cold. That's he's out cold. Greatest move ever. My favorite. But, but look, here, here's the genius behind that. Here's the genius behind that. The match hasn't started yet. Flair can't have a match because he's unconscious. Yeah. So you just took the heavyweight champion of the world, and now you have a non-finish finish because you got over way more than you ever could have gotten over if you had beaten him, if you're Jake the Snake Roberts and you're the top baby face in the territory. Ric Flair still leaves with the title. Ric Flair got so much heat. And in 30 seconds, you did that with the fans, with one move, with one move. That's That's genius. Hey, you everybody need to drop a like a that. PayPal or something because you just gave everybody a master class on that's psychology. psychology. Absolutely, absolutely, man. And so, you know, what what would make sense in a real fight? What would make, Jake had enough? Boom, he hits 
him with his finisher, he gets him with it, and because it's a because it's a finisher, Flair doesn't get up. Yeah, too many people get up from the DDT now, and I, dude, I, I just, I absolutely hate how it's watered down because to me, it's it's the greatest move ever. I did it to they, a kid in high school everything. that was fucking with me, and I, on the gym floor, I thought I was gonna kill him, but it, hey, man, you didn't like I was laying some defense heavy on him in basketball, and he, <laughs> do you start shoving me? I was like, uh, uh-uh, bam. Dropped his ass. <laughs> I, I did never, that high school. I never lash. I I never saw it from the perspective of so everything you were just saying. I actually always and, and I talk about it sometimes way more than I should. Uh, yeah. I blame. I blame. I always blame the fans because with wrestling, uh, they uh, like the fan. They make is, the business good or bad though. They well, make there's always the one business. opponent and another opponent, and then the third person is the fans. Like wherever you go, that's why it was like tough, but good. And I'm glad a lot of these companies figured it out during uh, COVID when you couldn't have fans uh, as weird as it was in a lot of times. But uh, so it's 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 not a vicious circle, but it is a circle. And I, like I, I'm very grateful for your perspective because I, I can add <laughs> I'm not going to add more bitterness to it, to my opinions, but it makes me think. Because the wrestlers do interact with the fans and the fans interact with the wrestlers. And it's this like circle. And I do like a lot of the top talent in AEW. They, they mess with the fandom. They are dead serious. They are a couple steps ahead. And they have like a good head on their shoulders about how to do certain things. But we do talk way too much. Like me as like, like I'm part of this podcast and Wallace and Bodie, who you haven't met are hardcore. They know so much about the history. They are way more passionate, but I, when I watch it, I'm the guy, just like when I watch an action movie or anything else. And I want to be entertained when I watch that, I don't want to know the history. I like, not the history. I'm sorry. I just want to be entertained. I want to watch the story, the match as it's happening. You want to play out. Yeah. I don't want to like we did a we we uh we uh, had a discussion about a question about who's going to be the next AEW champion when is MJF going to be the champion? It was fun to speculate and talk, but the three of us don't actually give a shit. Give me a good story, and I, so there's way too much talk of the story. Like you would talk about, like you said, there's way too much talk about booking instead of talking about. What What's you presented. just watch and what is what has been presented, and so a byproduct of that is, uh, like even sometimes when you watch a match and like you said, you see all these awesome maneuvers and all see all these awesome moves, and then, you know why? Uh, uh, then they do like twenty like twenty like kickouts or something. And me I, as a casual Reds, fan, the, I hate that. What, what's the one I, we talked about a million times? The Canadian Destroyer. Yeah, nobody but, should kick out of that because no. that's a fucked up move. <laughs> If you not only, somebody... that, not only that, but I'll be honest with you, I got other issues for Canadian Destroyer too, is because a lot of times I see that particular move, and and I don't really remember it being around when I wrestled, and I didn't mean to interrupt you guys, but to to me, it it physically doesn't look like it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't. That's why it's so like you know the physics of it. The physics of it, though, I don't see how somebody can actually. If you were having a real legitimate shoot fight with somebody, how would somebody give you the Canadian Destroyer? I exactly. sometimes get confused at who's supposed to be hurt. <laughs> that's my point. That's my point. And so that's part of the problem. So let me let me say a couple of things, if you don't mind, that speaks to exactly what you were saying. The first and foremost and fundamentally most important is to kind of go back to what I was trying to uh, articulate in regards to treating it like it's real, right? Um, it's okay for you to know that it's not real and still treat it like it's real. An example of that is I love magic. You know, take me to Las Vegas. Let me say a great magic show. You know what I don't want to happen? What I don't want to happen is for the magician then to come back out after it's all over and go, well, let me show you exactly how we did that trick. <laughs> I don't need to know. I'm like you, man. I'm like, I don't need to know. Now, yeah. the, the the closest I can come to that at, at all is to watch Penn and Teller fool us. But just because they're entertaining. But as far as a magic trick show, let me suspend my belief. While I'm there, let me sit and enjoy it. Let me watch you do the trick and go, wow, that was freaking awesome. That was cool. That guy's got some talent because he made me believe whatever I was supposed to believe in that moment. Poof, you made an elephant disappear. So all that's awesome and it's good and it's great. And and so in the same way, from a wrestling perspective, I'm not saying insulting the intelligence of the fans. I'm just saying, why are you constantly telling them this will work? 
And why are you constantly presenting it as it's just entertainment, it's just a work, instead of making it a legitimate uh, combat situation in sport? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it would make the matches better. Now, that's from a that's just from a how we present it standpoint. Like that's a presentation standpoint. Now, from a practical standpoint of the wrestling match, to speak more broadly or more specifically to, to what you were talking about there. There's not enough fan, there's not enough wrestlers when they're young in the business that know how to listen to the fans. I'm sure you've heard that before, right? The number one thing when you're learning psychology is you learn how to listen to the fans. And so that's the next stage. You go from just doing a bunch of high spots for the sake of doing high spots and you're not selling them properly. And then you learn to listen to the fans, what they're reacting to, what they're not reacting to. Scott Hall said this one time, as a matter of fact, we're sitting there, we're having dinner. And he goes, he goes, he goes, look, this is what I do when I'm having a match, man. I just, bro, I listen to the fans. And if they, if they, if it gets a reaction, bro, if it gets a reaction, I leave that in the match the next time I have a match. If it doesn't get a reaction, I take that out of the match the next time I have a match. And he didn't care what it was. Like he, he doesn't care if he's talking about it flicking a toothpick or or doing the doing the trash slam on you, right? So he didn't care. He's talking about all of it. And uh it is it's it's so simple, but it's so true. But there's another level of that. Everybody talks about listening to the fans. What you never hear anybody talk about is talking to the fans. And the way that we talk back to the fans, if you're in a wrestling match, which is another evolution, another step beyond just listening to the fans is I'm not just listening for you to tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing. I'm telling you what you should and shouldn't believe. Manipulating emotion. Absolutely. And so how do you do that? Another example of how you do that is I've always, when I've trained guys and I've talked to guys and walked through things with them in the ring and, and tried to explain psychology of a match to them, the most beautiful and the most elegant and the most simplistic way I think to explain that is to talk about the punch. Uh-oh, what about the punch? What about the punch? What about the punch, Lash LaRue? <laughs> it's another cliffhanger. Tune in next week to Juice Pro Wrestling and hear part two with Lash LaRue. You gonna do sex to me? Did you like that video? If so, be sure to hit like and subscribe and check out more killer content from your boys at Juice Pro Wrestling. Whoa, yeah!